Good morning and happy Tuesday morning to you. Thank you for tuning in to another Bible study. So glad that you're with us. And uh, we look to you, Father. We depend on you, Holy Spirit. We depend on you. We can do nothing without you. So I believe the Holy Spirit is going to speak through me and he's going to give you ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. So let's make our confession of faith and get right into today's teaching. Repeat after me. I'm God's heir. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I'm one spirit with the Lord. And all the promises of God are mine. I receive all the promises of God by faith. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. We're going to begin reading at verse 11. And we've been dealing uh, uh, with this word spin. S-P-E-N-D. Spin. When you think about that word, there's really two things you can spend. You can spend time and you can spend money. And uh, we're in a season where God is drawing us unto himself. When God draws us unto himself, he builds us up so that we can offer up spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing, that are acceptable and pleasing to him. Now, us offering up spiritual sacrifices is predicated on us being built up, us being built up as a result of us coming to God because he's the only one who can build us up. Amen. And so the, that word spend, spend, especially uh, first and foremost, how we spend our time daily determines how we're going to spend the rest of our days. Amen. So that word spend is synonymous with you and I Spending our days for what God wills. Amen. We find that phrase in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. But let's look at Job 36, verse 11, because it reveals to us the way God wants us to spend our days and our years. Now, uh, Job 36, 11 starts off with the word if. So if implies a condition. So if they obey and serve him, that's the condition. That's the condition. Uh, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years. You can also add that word spend because that, that even though it's not there, it's implied. Or spend their years in pleasantness and in joy. That's, that's what God wants for us. God wants for us to spend our days in prosperity, in our years in pleasantness and joy. That's the condition. That's the outcome that God wants you and I to experience, but it's predicated on us spending time obeying or spending our days obeying and serving the Lord. So if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness and in joy. Now, let's deal with that if. If they obey and serve. Turn to, turn to Psalm chapter 40. Turn to Psalm chapter 40. If this is going to be a reality, we have to get a hold of this principle, comprehend it, grasp it, so that we can walk in it and we can live our lives in the condition that God wills for us. There's an important principle in Psalm 40, verse 6, that you and I need to understand so we can apply it. And Psalm 46 says, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, nor have you delight in them, and here's, here it is. You have given me the capacity to hear and obey. Now, this is the psalmist speaking as an individual, but I believe it's very clear in this scripture. Although he's speaking to God himself, he's really speaking on the behalf of all mankind. He's really speaking on behalf, the behalf of all mankind. Because if there's one thing that God had a problem with, or one consistent theme through the Old and New Testament. God's people have a, a history of being disobedient. Amen. I believe that applies to, to you. I believe that applies to me. When we look over our lives, all of us have disobeyed God at one time or another. Amen. And there's a reason. Now, uh, one scripture... Uh, outlines 
uh, God's contention, a contention that he had and still has with his people, and that contention is that his people don't know him by way of personal experience, and that that lack of personal knowledge of God through personal experience has to deal with the word that we're dealing with, that word spin. And the reason is, is because God's people have a history of neglecting to spend the time that we require in the presence of God to receive the capacity to hear and obey. Without the capacity that's given, let me say it this way, without the God-given capacity to hear and obey God, you won't be able to obey God. It's impossible. Amen. Remember, God created us to, to live in union with him. Adam was created to live in union with God. When Adam sinned, that union was broken, and we were born in that state where we were born spiritually dead or born separated with God. To be, to be uh, technical, you and I were born without the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who imparts the capacity both to hear and to obey God. The Holy Spirit is God in us. And God in us, uh, in the person of the Holy Spirit, he, he is the one working in us, giving us the capacity, or working in us both to will and to do. That word will uh, talks about our desire. And then in the, our desire, our decision making. Uh, without the Holy Spirit working his desire into us, we wouldn't even have the desire to obey God. So a part of, the, a part of obeying God is receiving the desire to obey him. That doesn't come from us. It's not an innate uh, characteristic. It's not an innate aspect of human nature because our human nature is without God. Amen. I like the way the uh, Amplified Version describes our human nature. It's, it's, our, it's our human nature, sense and reason, without the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we don't have the capacity to obey God. But if you're a sincere Christian, you start off in that deception and in, in, in our sincerity. In our human sincerity, we go out and try to obey God. But as we get closer to God, we start to get clarity. And you'll realize a big part of your motive for obeying God isn't really to please God. It's to make you feel better about yourself. You know, we can do things. Um, see, because with, without the Holy Spirit's work, let's, let's go a little, let's go beneath the surface. Without the Holy Spirit doing what he's been ordained to do, one of the key things, one of the foundational things that the Holy Spirit is ordained to do, and the fact that he's ordained to do it means he's the only one that can do it, which means without him doing it, it won't be done. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit has been ordained by the Father to do is to convince us of our righteousness. Let me say that in a more biblically accurate way. The Holy Spirit has been ordained by God to convince us, convince us of the righteousness that we receive from God as a gift. That righteousness belongs to Jesus. The righteous Jesus is our righteousness. So the Holy Spirit, one of his foundational jobs is to convince us of the gift of righteousness that you and I have received in Christ Jesus. Now, until that happens, you and I uh, will be struggling with guilt and with shame. And as long as we're not rooted and convinced and been taught by the Holy Spirit, the righteous that, righteousness that we've been given a gift, the righteousness of Jesus that we've received as a gift from God, that guilt and that shame will be present and it will drive certain behaviors. 
Amen. If you were to be honest, a lot of us come to church. A lot of us involve ourselves in quote unquote religious activities in, 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 in an attempt to ease guilt. Amen. We feel that if we don't come to church, then God is going to be upset with us. And if, if, we're di if we've disciplined ourselves to come to church every Sunday, we, we've also built up or built into us a mindset that, that is proud, proud, that I, that you're, that, proud of the fact that you're a consistent churchgoer, which is a good thing. But it has absolutely nothing to do with your righteousness. It has absolutely nothing to do with God's love for you. But since we're doing that, we build up that belief. And that's a result of our pride. That's a result of us doing things, doing good things for the wrong reason. That, that's that's a, a, a result of us being driven by, by things that the Holy Spirit has yet to work out of us. Amen. So, when we look at the scripture, if we look at us obeying God and, how, and the approach that we need to take, even us understanding that approach is a part of a process. Let's look at uh, James chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, you and I are being molded. The Bible doesn't say that we have been molded. The Bible says that we're undergoing a process of being molded. And that process will continue to take place to the point that we leave our body, to the point like those of us who are alive, uh, and it looks like it based on current events that we're going to be alive when Jesus comes back. So until Jesus comes back, until the rapture happens, Jesus appear, appears in the cloud, until these vile bodies are changed like unto his glorious body, we're going to be undergoing that molding process. Or if we die, we leave our bodies prior to the return of Jesus Christ, that molding will be taking place right up to that very moment. Amen. So let's look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. The, one of the things that is, a, that is a hindrance to us is our lack of realization of the things I just talked about. We, 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 we live this life with a lack of clarity with regard to who we are. Amen. So we're very susceptible to deception. James chapter 4, verse 6. It says, but he gives more and more grace. This is what grace is. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency in all others fully. And the evil tendency he's talking about is idolatry. Idolatry is us using people, places, things um, to fulfill us. To, to, we, 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 have, we, we expect people, places, and things to do what only God can do. Only God can satisfy us. Uh, another thing that, that we're unaware of, you know, we'll, we'll say things with our mouth because we can read scripture, we can memorize scripture, but memorizing scripture doesn't mean that that scripture has become revelation to you. So we say, I'm a spirit, uh, you know, I have a soul and I live in a body, but the way we live our, we, the way we live our lives, we live, we live as if we're just a body. Like, we live as if the body is us. And we are not our body, because the Bible says that we can be absent from the body. So the evidence that we don't believe that we're spirits, we don't have that revelation, is that we live life according to the flesh. We, we live life every day catering to our flesh, overindulging in the flesh. If you're overindulging in the flesh, it's obvious that you don't believe that you're a spirit. If you were a spirit, you would be aware you would have experienced the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit. That, that's, that's how you, real, it's not through reading the Bible. 
It's through the Holy Spirit taking those scriptures and teaching you and giving you experience with those scriptures that makes it real, that gives you the ability to, to realize or perceive the reality of what the scripture is saying. So it, until you experience the Holy Spirit truly witness, bear witness with your spirit, you really won't understand that you are a spirit, and that's how God deals with you. Amen. Glory to God. That's how God sees us. That's how he deals with us. He deals with us for who we are in the spirit, not for what we are in the flesh. But he gives us more and more grace, power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. So you and I have evil tendencies. Say, say it with me, but let's personalize it. Let's say, I have evil tendencies. We'll say that together on the count of three. One, two, three. I have evil tendencies. But here's the thing. We are not aware of all of our evil tendencies. And we ha if we have evil tendencies that we're not aware of, we won't cooperate with God in addressing them. But all of our evil tendencies need to be addressed. Otherwise, even though we're not aware of them, they're lurking. And at some point, they're going to manifest in our behavior. Amen. But he gives us more and more grace, power of the Holy Spirit, to meet these evil tendencies and all others fully. That is why he says God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace continually to the lowly. Now, these are the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. Now, I, I want to look at that phrase, but I want to leave that last word off. So we're going we're gonna leave to it, leave it out of it. It is in reference to grace, but here's what God is working. The Holy Spirit, one of his main objectives is to work in us to get us to the place where we're humble enough to receive. We're humble enough to receive. Now that word, it is important because it's talking about grace and all of us need grace because all of us have evil tendencies and the only remedy for our evil tendencies is grace. But grace is only given to the ones who are humble enough to receive. Now, receiving goes against our fallen human nature. Our fallen human nature is one of pride, and the biblical definition of pride is operating independent of the power and influence of God. And since, and since we have evil tendencies that drive us, amen, if we have evil tendencies that drive us, and that and those evil tendencies, it, it, the, the will of God is for those evil tendencies to have less and less and less influence over us. That's the will of God. See, the, the goal of a Christian is to be spiritually minded. What does that mean? That means that my spirit had, or my soul um, has more inf is more influenced by my spirit. We have to get to the place where we discipline ourselves to where our souls are in subject to our spirit. That's the goal, to be spiritually minded. Why? So we can walk in the spirit and so that we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The only reason we're fulfilling the lusts of the flesh is because we're not walking in the spirit. And the reason we're not walking in the spirit is because we're not spiritually minded, meaning that our soul is under the influence of our flesh, our evil tendencies, as, as opposed to the Holy Spirit who lives in our spirit. In order for us to live like that, it takes discipline. That's why in our last message we talked about God. One of the things God's wanted, God wants to do to you when you come to him is open your ear to discipline and give you instructions regarding to discipline. Each and every one of us require a certain amount of time in the presence of God so that we can receive sufficient grace to live a life where we overcome, where we put to death those evil tendencies. 
so they don't dictate to us or so we don't yield to, the, to their dictates. Because as long as you have flesh, it's going to make demands on you. So God has, to, God has to, to lead us through a process of humility. Humility is diametrically opposed to our fallen human nature. So humility is a thing that's developed over a process of time. There, there are certain things that you need to experience that cause a greater level of humility. Humility. Each and every one of us have to undergo that. Uh, we see that here in Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. It says, when swelling and pride come. So when swelling and pride come, that's our human nature. So there are certain situations that the Holy Spirit will lead us into. There are certain situations that the Holy Spirit will lead us into, even, does, even though it doesn't seem like he will lead us into those situations, he does. Because remember, we have evil tendencies, but we're not aware of all of our evil tendencies. You can say pride, or you can say evil tendency. The, the main evil tendency is pride. Amen. What's the, what's the primary manifestation of pride? A lack of prayer. How can you depend on God and you don't pray. It's impossible. How can you depend on God and you don't pray? So really, what, 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 is the, what is the root of all sin? The root of all sin is not praying. If grace is the remedy for sin, if grace is the power of the Holy Spirit to meet our evil tendencies fully, then we have to go to the throne to receive grace. We have to come to him to receive grace. We have, see, the, when we talk about coming to him, we come to him, why? To spend time, to spend adequate time so that we can receive the adequate amount of grace. Each and every one of us requires something different from God. And that's why the God has to deal with you personally. Coming to God is not coming to church. That involves you coming to church. But coming to God is coming to him. Coming to God is coming to him on your own so he can deal with you as an individual. The worst thing you can do is try to duplicate somebody else's relationship with God. It's okay, and, and it's, it's God's plan for us to draw inspiration from somebody else's relationship with God. It's, it's God's, that's why we have men of God and women of God. It's God's plan for other people, namely the fivefold ministry, to set the example. And you follow their, you know, the Apostle Paul said, follow me. But he says it's a very important thing. Follow Christ. Well, how do you do that? How do you follow somebody who's following, following Christ? That means you have to know Christ for yourself. Otherwise, how are you going to gauge whether that person is following Christ? Again, you have to come to him. There's no way around it. The the ideal church member is one who comes to God. When they leave church, they come to God. That's the ideal church member. That's, that's the whole design of this thing. Remember the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 20, him talking to other preachers, other, other ministry leaders. His primary advice to them was, I commend you to God. He pointed them to God. That's what we do. We're supposed to point people to God. And so you have your own experience with God. Then you can really know. You, then you can really know. Or is my leader following God? I can see because I should see God in my leader. Amen. A man of, a man of God comes from God. And how do I gauge that? My man of God should, should display godly characteristics. Amen. So it's, 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 it's God's plan for us to follow men, but the, the men that we follow ultimately have to point us to God because a man of God, a true man of God, is a true man of God because he, he himself has gone to God and goes to God, and God is the one who makes that man who, who he should be. 
And so, I mean, if any man of God is honest, they're continually pointing you to God. That's what we've been doing. That's what our pastor's been doing. And as one submitted to him, that's what I've been doing, pointing you to God. And I mean, you, if you have any honesty in you at all, what, what else could you do? If you, if you have clarity, if God has given you clarity, if you've seen the Lord, if you perceive God, then the, the more clearly you perceive God, the more clear your perception of, of God is, the more clear your, the perception of yourself is. And anybody who sees them, them for who they really are is going to say, I point you to God. You look at the pro progression in the Apostle Paul's life. He went from saying, I, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. Then he said, then after he got closer to God and grew in God, he, he then went on to say, I'm the least of all the saints. He grew some more, got closer to God, and developed more humility. Then he said, I'm, I'm, I'm worse than the, 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 the worst sinner because I persecuted the church of God. So we should see that, that, that progress in this, this, this statement here. We're looking at Proverbs 11, 2. It says, when, swine, when, when swelling in pride come, I try to put the two good words together, swine. When swelling in pride come, then emptiness and, and shame come also. But with, with the humble, those who are lowly, who have been pruned and, tr and chiseled by trial. All of us have to undergo this process of pruning and chiseling. If you're, if you're not going undergoing the process of pruning and chiseling, I got, I got something very important to tell you. You are not saved. You're not born again. You're fatherless because those whom God loves, he chastens. You're not bearing, you haven't bared any fruit up until this point because Jesus said those who bear fruit, they have to undergo pruning so that they can come out of that pruning bearing bigger and better fruit being more effective. Amen. So if, if you've never experienced God correcting you, go to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, read them, and do what it tells you to do so you can get born again. What Romans 10 and 9 and 10 tell you to do, it says that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, believe that with your heart and confess the same with your mouth then you shall be saved. Once that happens, the Holy Spirit is going to come live on the inside of you. you. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are going to become one. You're going to have conviction at that point. Uh, a major a major um, a result or proof that the Holy Spirit lives in you is that you have conviction. And he's going to correct you. When swelling and pride come, then emptiness and shame come. Also, but with the humble... Those who are lowly and who have been pruned or chiseled by trial and renounce self. This is what happens when you get clarity about who you really are. You come to the place where you renounce self. Well, what's the evidence? What's the evidence that somebody has renounced self? That person comes to God, not because they want to, but because they need to. You don't renounce self if you don't see a reason to renounce self. You renounce self because you come to the point where you really understand by revelation of the Holy Spirit and through personal experience that your butt is a sinner, that you need God's help. Without God, you can't make it. You really start to see because you've been pruned and chiseled by trial that in him you live and that in him you move. And that in him you have your being. You truly, you truly start to take the heart and understand how true Jesus' statement was. Without me, you can do nothing. You truly start to see him as the vine. And you start to see yourself as a branch. And you see, apart from, apart from him, you can't live. So prayer becomes like oxygen. You, you literally are afraid to leave your house 
without spending time with God because you really know who you are. You wake up in the morning understanding that there's evil tendencies lurking in your body that can dictate to your soul and you have had experience being overcome by your evil tendencies. And you come to the place where you understand that grace and grace alone is the sole remedy for your evil tendencies. And you know that in order to receive grace, you have to come to him. You have to come to the throne and spend adequate time daily so that you receive adequate grace to walk in in order to subdue and really rule over the evil tendencies that lurk in your bodily members. Philippians 2, we don't have time to go there, but there, I love this statement. Why do I love it? Because I've experienced it. It's a part of my life. It's a part of what the Holy Spirit has developed in me, self distrust. If you don't trust yourself, what is the evidence of that? What is the primary evidence that somebody is walking in self-distrust? They pray. They spend time in the presence of God. And it's not because they want to. It's because they have to. It's a vital necessity. You can't live without him. You can't live without him. That's revelation to you. That's revelation to you. You need him. The Holy Spirit has uncovered and revealed to you the true cry of your soul. When the Bible talks about your heart, it's talking about your soul. What is your soul thirst for? It thirsts for him. It thirsts for the presence of God. Your soul in order for your soul to rest, it needs the presence of God. Most of us are so weary because we're trying to live life. Our life has a certain amount of weight. And if you, and if you really realize it, if you're spending time with God and you've gone through pruning and chiseling, you come to this conclusion, the weight of my life is too much for me to bear. So I need help. Help comes in the form of grace. Grace is found at the throne. Amen? So, what are we telling you to do? What, what, are we, what are we really begging you to do? Come to him and spend time in his presence daily. Come to him. Spend time in his presence daily. Center your life around the presence of God. It's time for us to wake up. There, there, I mean, unless you have been, have been living up under a rock, there is a global alarm clock ringing, telling us to wake up. The Spirit of God is telling us to look up for our redemption draws nigh. Amen? So come to him. Come to him. I want, I, I want to live in this reality. I want to spend my days coming to him so that when he comes, our conversation, our fellowship just continues. I want to be able to say, Jesus, Jesus, yesterday, just yesterday, I was, I was on earth in my body and this is what we were talking about. And it would say, you know what, son? I remember that. I don't want it to be like, wow, this is the first time I ever meet you. That's how all of us, all of us, all of our fellowship should, should just be uninterrupted. Like when we get raptured, it's like, man, I was just talking to you. I was just thinking about you. And here you are now. I can, I can actually see your face now. Wow. But all these, we're living in a time where prophecy is being fulfilled like pretty much on a daily basis. And look how it happens. It comes in the twinkling of an eye. It comes like a thief in the night. That's how the rapture goes. Just like, just like what's going on now. 
the rapture going to happen just like that when nobody's looking. But for those of us who are coming to him and hearing his voice and those of us who are living and abiding in his presence, it won't come as a thief in the night. Amen? So, uh, we're out of time. Thank you for joining us once again. Now, for you that are going to uh, return the tithe and give offerings, we have two options available to you, our online family. Number one, you can go to buylifechristianfellowship.com and do your giving online. And those of you who choose the mail option, you see that address at the bottom of your screen in the description box. So having said that, uh, God bless you. I want to invite you to the meetings that we're having this week and next week. This week, our pastor is going to have meetings beginning tomorrow or tomorrow night at 7 p.m., uh, going on through uh, Friday night at 7. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Amen. So we'll give you the times for next week. Uh, next week. Amen. So God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday evening right here at Vine Life. For more information on Vine Life Christian Fellowship, please visit our website at www.vinelifechristianfellowship.com. Options concerning the tithe, offerings, partnership, or favor challenge are located in the description box below. It is our hope that you have been blessed and enlightened by this message. As we begin our online journey, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel ensuring that you will not miss future messages. On behalf of Vine Life Christian Fellowship, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next time.